All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. How are we feeling this morning? Woo! We're pretty good this morning. Y'all did have your coffee this morning. Listen, I also want to welcome everyone who's watching with us live online right now. Listen, it is true. Y'all could be doing anything this morning. It's an honor you chose to spend your morning with us. And listen, I'm excited about today. If I've not met you, my name is Matt Powers, as we are in week three of our series, Coping, Hoping, and Doping. And if you are new here, you may be thinking, what's that even supposed to mean? You know, I was hoping for encouragement, like, hey, this is the, door, the day the Lord has made, and just feel good about myself whenever I leave here today. But the reason for this whole series really comes from the idea that we go through different seasons and difficult times in our lives. And Jesus even says in Matthew chapter 5, he says, it rains on both the just and the unjust. Meaning this, that if you love Jesus, you follow Jesus, you believe in Jesus, or you don't and you don't have any care in the world about Jesus whatsoever, guess what? You're still gonna go through difficult times all the way across the spectrum. Anyone you come in contact with, we're gonna go through difficult things. Reality is we live in a sin-fallen, broken world. Life's tough. Life is hard. It's not always easy. I know someone is thinking, I did not wake up and get out of bed this morning for some joker to tell me life's tough. I could have stayed in bed and I know that all by myself. But here's the thing, we don't handle it well at all. In fact, we stink at handling difficult times. And that's what this whole series is designed to do. So if you wanna go ahead and pull out your notes inside of your worship guide, follow along with us. If you're not a note taker, that's cool. We all have bad habits. Today is that day where we break bad habits, no big deal. But the theme verse we're using for this series is out of John chapter 14, verse 27. This is Jesus talking. He says, peace is what I leave you with. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. That's the secret sauce. Y'all, that's the difference right there. The peace that Jesus gives is the difference when you see people who handle difficult things well versus people who handle them not well so well. It's the peace that Jesus gives. He gives a peace unlike anything that we could ever imagine. It's a peace that we don't understand. It's important for us to understand that the world cannot give what the world does not have. The world doesn't have this type of peace, but also that whenever you do experience it and you experience Jesus and you understand that the world cannot take back what the world never had in the first place. It simply can't. And that's the difference. And all series long, you know, we've been talking about these things. In week one, we said it's bigger than a Band-Aid, meaning that so many of us have this trauma and these giant gaping wounds. And we said a Band-Aid will fix this. No big deal. Pop a Band-Aid, some Neosporin on that sucker. I'll be good to go in a week or so. But that's just not really the case. Last week, we talked about a first aid kit and having a toolkit to be able to get through some of these things, having tools that we know when something happens, we can pull out our first aid kit we're going to make it through it, and it's going to be okay. But today we've titled the message, When Only the Doctor Will Do. Because there's a lot of times a Band-Aid's not going to cut it. What we find in our first aid kit isn't going to cut it. We need to go seek a professional. We need to go find someone who knows what they're doing, who knows what they're talking about, to be able to actually deal with these wounds that we have, to be able to make us whole again. You know, Jesus said that he did not come for the righteous. He didn't come for those who have everything all together all the time, but that Jesus showed up for the sick, showed up for those who needed a doctor. And if we are the church and we exist for the world and we are the hope of the world, listen, we're not a country club for the perfect. If that's what you're looking for, this ain't the spot for you. We are the hospital for the sick. And listen, this is a place where Jesus exists. The doctor is in the house. It's a place where if you are ill, if you are sick, if you are in need of the doctor, he's in the house. Let's go. That's who Jesus is. And that's what this message today is about, what only the doctor will do. Y'all, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. Amen. I know. Let's just, whew, hold on. I didn't show up to be talked about about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's a little weird. I don't understand the Holy Spirit. I don't like the Holy Spirit. That's not okay. I, I just, mm, doesn't make me feel good. But we're going to try today to break down some of those walls to truly understand who the Holy Spirit is. So Cliff's Notes version, just kind of dumb it down for us to understand because this is how I need it. I need it to talk to me like I'm a five-year-old so I can fully understand what's going on here. Essentially, in the beginning, there was God. He had Adam and Eve. He was walking amongst his creation. Things were good. They were laughing. They were having a good time. And then all of a sudden, sin entered into the world. And it completely separated that intimate, close relationship God had with his creation. Separated it. 
So God sends his son, Jesus, who his sole purpose in life of how why he came to earth was so he would take the sins of the world, bear the worries, the mistakes, all the problems, all the stuff of the world for anyone and everyone who has ever and will ever exist. That was his job. And he came and he did that job. But Jesus then says, hey, I can't be everywhere all at once. I can't be all over the place. I got to go. It's time for me to hit the road. And everyone's kind of freaking out. Well, what do you mean? Jesus? He's saying, I got to go. But when I do leave, I'm going to send you a friend, man. I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be with you forever. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Listen, Holy Spirit's not something weird. Holy Spirit's not an it. Holy Spirit's not a thing. Holy Spirit is a person. That's who he is. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit actually comes and he's there. Listen, anyone fly? Anyone go on trips like to fly? We like to fly sometimes. Most of the time, flying is awful. Listen, you wait in long lines. You go through security. People are angry. They're upset. You're waiting. You're delayed. You're sitting towards the back of the plane, usually in the middle seat. You're crunched into there. You got to sit on the plane for a very, very long time. They come by. They give you a little glass of something, not even the whole bottle, but just a small glass to wash down the unsalted awful pretzels that they're going to give you. You're an annoyance to the, to the flight attendants, and that's what flying is. And that's how many of us believe this life is supposed to be, that, hey, it's like sitting in the middle row or the, the middle seat in row 35 on a flight across the country. It's no fun whatsoever. But if you ever flown first class, listen, I've got to be bumped up to first class just a couple of times, and it is another world. Y'all, it's a whole nother level. You go in there, you sit down, the chair is like a lazy boy at the house. It reclines, it's comfortable, there's plenty of room, there's all sorts of leg room. They say, good morning, Mr. Powers, how are you doing today? You get in okay this morning, everything going okay, is the temperature all right? Would you like a blanket, a pillow, a sleep mask? Because it is a fairly long flight, you need some coffee, some water, some juice, a Coke. What can we do for you, Mr. Powers? On the flight today, we'll have eggs, bacon, sausage, pancakes, hash browns. We even have some steak if you'd like steak and eggs. We have toast, we have all sorts of stuff. Is there anything you need, Mr. Powers? How's your flight so far? Is it lean back okay? Can you hear okay? Do you need some different headphones? It's incredible. Much better than flying back in row 35 where they're throwing pretzels at you saying, enjoy the flight, and that's it. But many of us are walking through this life like we're back on row 35. And when we experience the Holy Spirit, we realize there's a whole nother level when the Holy Spirit gets involved. It's like flying in first class. The Holy Spirit's not weird. My wife has a sign, a, a picture in our house, says weird is the side effect of awesome. We're all weird, y'all. We're all weird in our own strange little way. And that's the reason we think the Holy Spirit's weird because we just don't fully understand it. But weird is the side effect of awesome. The Holy Spirit is awesome and incredible. And when you experience, you're like, how did I not know about this sinner? So today, we're going to walk through a few things over the next few minutes that will hopefully break down some of those walls and we can really realize who the Holy Spirit is. All right, so let's pray. We'll dive in this morning. Father, we love you. And God, we're just, we're praying for your Holy Spirit today just to feel your presence in this room, whatever we walked in here with. We're all going through something some heavier than others. God, I just pray that we'll be open enough, that we'll receive what it is you wanna give us today, that we'll feel your power, we'll feel your Holy Spirit, we'll feel that nudge, we'll feel that whisper, those things that people don't even know about, that we're walking through all on our own. God, I pray that it'll come to the surface for you today, and that we'll walk out of here knowing you better than we did when we walked in here. And we'll give you all the credit for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So number one, the first thing the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit, he is here to convict us. Holy Spirit convicts us. Now we hear that word conviction or convicts and we kind of take a step back. We're like, well, I need, to, I need to learn a little bit more. Look at John chapter 16, verse eight. It says, when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. God's coming back, man. Jesus is coming back, and there's going to be judgment. A lot of us are thinking, man, I don't want to have that difficult conversation. It's going to happen. But he's a gracious, merciful, loving God. We get the opportunity to be there with him. But the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of its sin, 
but also of God's righteousness. Now, when we hear convict, we're thinking something bad. Like, I committed a crime. I'm about to go to jail. Things aren't going so well. My son, one of his favorite shows is On Patrol Live, if anyone watches this. It's like live PD or like cops. And they're following police departments all around the country and showing their interactions that they have with people. And it is wild, the things that they come in contact with, y'all. But we hear the word conviction, and we've talked about it with them before. And we think in the terms of, he's coming to convict us. I'm going to jail, and I'm not going to last in jail. And that's the mindset that we have, but that's not what the Holy Spirit is here to do. He's here to convict us. In other words, he's here to convince us, to give us convictions that we have. His goal is not to make you feel bad about the mistakes that you've had. His goal is to show you to move from unholy to holy, to show us that, hey, we really do need Jesus. Even if we think that we don't, we actually do. The Holy Spirit shows up to show us that there is a right and a wrong, that there is a truth and there is a lie. And I get it. 2023, we want to be sensitive. We want to be inclusive to everybody. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You know, just do whatever makes you happy. As long as it doesn't affect me, you're all good. We say things like, you go live your truth. I'm going to go live my truth. And we're all good. No problem whatsoever. But there can't be two truths for the same thing. It just can't. It doesn't work that way. I know sometimes we wish it did, but it just doesn't work that way at all. So how much do we really have to dislike somebody to not share truth with them? To not show them that, hey, I know you think this, but it's actually this. And not in a hateful way. Not like, well, you're awful. Can't believe you made that awful decision. How terrible are you? But to do it in a loving, kind way to say, hey, I see where you're going. Let me help you. Let me walk this thing out with you. That's what the Holy Spirit's here to do, to kind of give us that warning sign, to give us that nudge, to give us that little bit of a move. You know, anyone ever run out of gas before? You don't have to raise your hand. I know that's kind of embarrassing. But people run out of gas. You got to think, well, they got the gas light has to be broken. I don't understand how you can do that. See, car manufacturers said people are going to need to know when to get gas. So let's put this little gas light on there to let them know that, hey, you're about to run out of gas. You don't want to run out of gas. How about you go fill up and get gas? And the Holy Spirit doesn't work to say, God, please, I'm about to run out of gas. Please just fill my car up with gas. He ain't going to fill your car up with gas. He's going to say, there's 36 gas stations right here. Pull into one of those and fill it up yourself. See, the indicator light, the gas light, it's not there to make you feel bad. It's not saying, hey, stupid, I know you think you have 50 more miles. But you don't. You might want to get gas. He's not saying that at all. That's not what the gaslight is intended to do. The gaslight is there to say, hey, listen, you're running a little low. I don't want you to get stranded. How about you find one of these gas stations, fill out the gas, get you something to drink, get you a snack, and you go on your merry way. It's not there to hurt your feelings at all. It's just there to let you know that, hey, there's something going on that you need to be aware of. Listen, whenever you used to buy a car, the owner's manual would come. It would tell you all about the car, tell you what every single light meant, all the things it could do, tell you how to change the tire, change the oil, change the lights. It would tell you all sorts of stuff because they're the creator of that product and they're going to tell you the right way to go. But at some point in time, they had to put a big disclaimer on the owner's manual, don't drink the battery acid. (laughs) Why? Because someday some guy said, instead of getting something to drink, a bottle of water or Coke, I've always wanted to try battery acid. I think that might be a good idea. So that's what they did. And they're like, well, hey, we created this. We understand this is not healthy. This is not good. We need to let people know that, hey, you may feel like this would be a good idea, but it's not. You know, at some point in time, a bunch of young geniuses thought, I don't want potato chips. I don't want pop tarts. I don't want any cookies. But you know, I've always wanted to try those Tide Pods that you throw in the washer to get all the mud and dirt off my clothes. And that sounds awesome. And I think I'm going to have one of those instead of a snack I've got in the pantry. That's why Tide now has, hey, don't eat these things. They're dangerous. There's chemicals in them. The creator of the product knows best. If you go to Lowe's, you buy a chainsaw. It's going to tell you how to operate it so you don't chop off your arm. Because the creator of the product knows best. Instead of trying to figure it out all on its own, watching YouTube, watching TikTok, reading some sort of article from wherever, the creator knows best. So when it comes to us and how we're going to operate our lives, the convictions that we have, why would we not seek the one who made us? Why would we not seek the creator? So what does that type of conviction mean for you? 
for some of you, it may be just that feeling that you've done something for so long. You've gone down this road for so long. You've always done this. And for whatever reason, all of a sudden, you just have that feeling that maybe I don't need to do that thing anymore that I've been doing for so long. It's probably the Holy Spirit just giving you a little nudge saying, hey, this is an indicator. This isn't the best thing for you. Maybe you just feel drawn to God. For whatever reason, you feel drawn to God for some reason. You don't go to church. You don't read the Bible. You don't listen to worship music. You don't know who Jesus is. You don't know anything about all that. But for whatever reason, you just feel it down deep in your gut that, man, I'm just drawn to God somehow. And I can't understand why. There's a reason you're here this morning. This wasn't by accident. I know there's some of you don't want to be here. Like I was forced out of bed. I didn't want to come here today. That's the Holy Spirit knowing things, trying to create these convictions to say, hey, I see which way you're going. Maybe it would be best to do this instead. Convictions are the compasses of life that just keep us going in the right direction. Because if you're out in the desert without a compass, you're going to get lost. The same thing goes for our lives. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us. The second thing, the Holy Spirit's here to change us. The Holy Spirit is here to change us. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now that sounds pretty good. I don't know about you, but that said no condemnation. I can get on board with that. A life-giving spirit sounds good to me. Freed from death sounds great to me. True free, I, how can we not get on board with that? Sounds pretty good, but here's why we don't. We don't like change. Very few people actually like change change. I don't like change very much. Change is difficult. You know why we don't like change? Because we're no longer in full control. And we don't like being, not being in control. We don't like when things change just a little bit. Well, that's not where I used to set my keys. I want to set them here. I don't want them set over here. It's just change freaks us out a little bit. My wife, on the other hand, she handles change like a champ. And has no problem with it because she is mature enough to understand that sometimes change is actually good. I ain't there yet. Don't know if I'll ever be there. But I can remember one time, it was in December, we were about to have a Christmas party at our house like the next week. And I call her on my way home from work, say, hey, baby, how was your day? You know, all that stuff. And she says, hey, uh, you're not going to like this. And I know when I hear those words, I'm like, oh boy, something's about to happen here. She said, so I ripped up our kitchen floor. Well, I didn't know our kitchen floor was broken and needed to be ripped up. I, what, what's that? I, did, I didn't realize that when I woke up this morning, I would leave the house with one kitchen floor and then it would just no longer be there when I returned. What happened? Did the kitchen floor make you mad or something? You know, did it talk bad about you? What was wrong with our kitchen floor? She said, it was just time for a change. I didn't like it anymore. I was like, well, well, now this means I'm going to have to do all this extra work. I don't want to do this extra work. I kind of just want to come home and, and watch TV. I didn't want to rip up the kitchen floor, but the kitchen floor was ripped up. She had to say, don't worry, we have this full plan. It's going to work. It'll take just a few days. It took me a while to realize after we did it that, hey, this kitchen floor idea, it needed to change. I'm glad that she did that. I'm not very good with change like that. One time we were going to just take a little piece off of our mantle of our fireplace. Next thing I know, the entire fireplace was ripped out of the wall and gone. <laughs> Didn't know the fireplace had a problem, but apparently it did. And guess what? It was much better after the fact. We don't like change because it's difficult. And we don't fully understand it. Shared this with Columbiana a few weeks ago. There's a book called The Toyota Way. And The Toyota Way is talking about Toyota and how they really revolutionized production and the process that it takes to produce. And it's gone really not just within the auto industry, but in businesses all over the world. And it's really lean processing and process improvement and continuous improvement. And the whole big idea of the Toyota way in this book is that there's never going to be any person, never going to be any company or product or process that is ever perfect. That it can always be improved upon. It can always be a little bit better. And we're going to consistently and constantly work to make it better. One of the quotes from the book says this. Progress cannot be generated when you are satisfied with existing conditions. So the question is, how satisfied are you with your con existing conditions? Are you fully satisfied with where you sit right now? Are you satisfied with those conditions? Look at Galatians chapter 5. It says this. 
It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know about you, but those seem like some pretty good qualities in our lives. And I can't speak for you. I can speak for myself. But when I take a look around the world, within our country, within our communities, even within our friends and family, y'all, we're not doing a great job. We don't have a whole lot of self-control. We see something that looks good, even though we know it's not good, we don't care. We can't control ourselves whatsoever. We're not gentle at all. We're running around like a barbarian getting through anything that we possibly want. We have no faithfulness whatsoever. The moment something goes wrong, the moment something's not what we wanted it to be, the, something, the moment we feel wronged, I'm out of here. I'm God. Who needs them? Not a whole lot of goodness. We're not kind to anybody we don't have any patience. We know what we want, and we want it right this second, and no one is going to stop us. There's not a whole lot of peace in our world today. Look around. We're at war all over the place. There's no joy anywhere. We're happy. That's great. But happiness is fleeting because it's circumstantial. It's based off of that thing that I got. I got that special thing, and now I'm happy until I'm no longer happy. There's really no love whatsoever. Not in the way that Jesus loved, not in the way that the Holy Spirit loves. These are some changes that I think we could probably make. So how happy and satisfied are you with existing conditions? Are we living this out? Or are we just kind of laying there like a shell of ourselves trying to figure out the best way we possibly can to get along? It's like this balloon here. We know what balloons do, right? Balloons are fun, aren't they? Fill them up with water. We can throw them at each other. That would be real fun to do this morning, wouldn't it? Fill it up with air. It can be used for all sorts of things. But this balloon, it's going to be like the episode of The Office where Jim and Dwight are decorating, just nailing these to the walls. Office people will get that. Y'all need to watch The Office. But it doesn't do anything. It's just here. Just laying there. Come on, balloon. Do something cool. It's not very much fun. Balloons are no good until something happens. <laughs> Whenever it gets a little bit of air, it begins to change shape. <laughs> begins to look different. Now it has a different purpose than what we initially thought. It's still a balloon, but until it gets some sort of power, it's not able to do what it's supposed to do. Now we can tie it and we could play the let's keep the balloon up game and dive all over each other. That would be a fun way to spend the morning. We can hang them up on the wall. We can put them with other balloons, create this awesome decoration. Come on, we can make fun noises with them. Come on, that's fun. Kids love that. That's all sorts of good stuff. We can make other noises. We can let it out. It can be whatever shape. The balloon does not serve its purpose until it's filled with something. We're the same way. Now it's just laying there, still a balloon. It's not filled with anything. It's not really any fun anymore, is it? And what are we going to do? Until we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're just kind of laying there lifeless, not living out the path and the purpose that we're supposed to, just like this stupid balloon. To be spirit-led, we've got to be spirit-fed. So what are we doing to feed our spirit? Now listen, I'm not saying we need to eliminate all this stuff out of our lives and we need to completely change everything that we do and I need to create all this margin to do nothing but read my Bible and pray all the live long day. I'm not saying that at all, but how are we spending our time? I talked a few weeks ago about adults in the United States spend on average seven plus hours a day on some type of screen that is not work related. I mean, as we're scrolling on our phones, we're watching TV, we're on our iPads, our laptops, whatever it is, seven hours a day, non-work related, watching something. How much time do we spend listening to music? What type of music are we listening to? Is it the gym Friday morning? No holds barred, y'all. Unbelievable. For an hour, I heard anything and everything you could ever possibly imagine blasting through the radio at the gym. I heard it all. Nothing was cut out. We do that long enough, begins to change things. What kind of books are we reading? 
We read in all of the romance novels and this and that. Do we ever pick this one up? Again, I'm not saying we need to eliminate all of this stuff. I'm not saying we need to cut all this out. There's probably room for some margin, but maybe instead, just instead, just the thought, maybe we inject Jesus into some of these things that we actually do every day. Maybe just a little bit. Who are we talking to? Where do we spend most of our conversations? Is it with others, friends, family, just people arguing with random people on Facebook? Ha! <laughs> Show them. <laughs> are we talking to God? Here's the truth. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us. He comes to change us. And man, that power is right there ready for us. The reality is an hour a week in a setting like this ain't going to cut it. Y'all, it's, it's just not. The, the, this moment's great. For us, for us to truly experience the transformation, to truly experience everything God has for us, this ain't going to cut it. Think about it. If I spend an hour a week with my wife and that's it, marriage ain't going to go too well. Spend an hour a week with my kids, relationship's not going to be too great. Spend just an hour a week at work, not going to have a job for very long. So where are we spending our time? Maybe let's just insert Jesus in just a few areas, just here and there, and watch the difference it'll make. Are we, are we satisfied with our existing conditions? He's here to convict. He's here to change. And number three, he comforts us. He brings us comfort. John chapter 14, verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. A comfort. Y'all, we love being comfortable. Come on, this afternoon, so many of you are going to go home, you're going to change clothes, put the hoodie on, find that special spot on the couch, wrap yourself up in a blanket, maybe turn golf on the TV, and take that Sunday afternoon nap that we love so much. Sunday afternoon naps hit just a little bit different. Why? Because, man, we are just wrapped up so comfortable. And it feels so good. We're desperately seeking comfort. But we have fallen to the lie of the enemy where we've been tricked that instead of comfort, we're just trying to seek numbness to hide the pain. And that's where we currently stand. Write this down as a reference, Micah chapter 7. This is true for all of us. He says, even though I have fallen, I will rise. Meaning that no matter how bad it has gotten, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I will rise. What that means is for some of you, you started down a road that you thought you could manage. And then for whatever reason, the road began to manage you instead. And you said things like, it's not that big of a deal. I would never go that far. I would never do that. It will never get that bad. I'll never make that mistake. I'll never make that decision. And then circumstances change and all of a sudden we wake up somewhere and say, how did I get here? Maybe someone even reached out and said, hey, I kind of see the decisions you're making, the things that you're doing. It's probably not the best thing for you. And we say things like, get off my back. Stay out of my business. I got this under control. Who are you to tell me what I should do? And then before we know it, We're spiraling out of control. We're lost and we don't know what to do. And we are not okay with supernatural comfort. The comfort that Jesus talks about. We're not okay with it because we've conditioned ourselves to the counterfeit comfort of culture instead. Starts even at a young age. Their kids are crying. Let's shove a pacifier in their mouth. Throw them a blanket. Give them a tablet. Turn on the TV. Anything to just make it stop. Well, we'll hide behind the makeup and the clothes and the hair and the sports and the video games and we'll do whatever we think not to feel like we're being exposed. We'll jump from relationship to relationship to relationship just to try and feel something. To make that just go away, we'll go to alcohol, drugs. We'll pop the bottle, pop the pill just to make it feel better. And it's all the lie of the enemy. That's what he says. He says, hey man, I know it's tough. I don't know how you're getting through it. I know it's been hard. And the marriage, I don't know how you're even still in it anymore. I have to deal with her every day? Girl at work, she's really cute though. Just saying, might help take the edge off just a little bit. You know, you, you deserve it. I don't know how you get through it. Just take this, it'll be okay. It's one joint, no big deal. Just one pill, I promise it'll make you feel better. And then we become needing it. All day. You deserve this. You need this. 
Just do it already. No big deal. You're going to be strong enough to get through it. This isn't going to hurt you. It's just to help take the edge off. You're going to be okay. You deserve this. You, you so badly. Look at all the other people who are doing it. They seem happy, don't they? Don't you want to feel what they're feeling? Aren't you sick and tired of feeling hurt and disgusted and sad and fearful? Don't you want to stop feeling that way? Don't you want the depression to go away? Just take it already. You need this. You deserve this. And we listen to that. And we take it. And then here he comes. That right hook. Just wham. You're such an idiot. I can't believe you fell for that. What were you thinking? <laughs> You're so stupid. What a horrible decision you made. This is who you are now. No one's going to ever forgive you for this. This is who you become. You're fractured. You're broken. No one will ever use you. Wait till your friends and family find out. Can't wait to see what they're going to say about you. What an utter colossal failure you have become. You're never going to get out of this. You're so stupid. You big idiot. That's what the enemy does. Man, we begin to believe it. And we believe the lie of the enemy as the truth and forgotten the truth of what Jesus said. That, hey, for God so loved the world, he sent his son, so those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. He also says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. He also says that if you believe in my teachings, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. That to get to heaven, to get to the Father, it goes through me. It says, if the Son sets you free, then you are truly free. And we have built up this wall. We put ourselves in this prison. And man, we're just dying in there. Thinking, this is who I am. This is who I become. This is who I'm supposed to be. It's not what Jesus says. No matter how far you fall, remember Micah chapter 7, even though I've fallen, I will rise. You still qualify. You're still good enough. You're not too far gone. You do still matter. You are still worthy. You know, when we look at Paul and Silas and Acts, they're just out doing what they're supposed to be doing, telling people about Jesus and how incredible he is and all of a sudden, they find themselves in the middle of a dark prison, chained to the walls, no windows, no nothing. And they're not just wallowing in self-pity, saying, God, how in the world could you do this to me? What were you thinking? can't believe I'd be so stupid to do this. The Bible teaches us that they were worshiping God. And at midnight, sure enough, Holy Spirit shows up, creates this huge earthquake. The chains are, are, are off of them now. The doors are flung wide open. And they could walk scot-free. It's where we stand today. For so many of us, we are locked in our jail cell. We are chained to the wall right now, just begging for freedom. The Holy Spirit comes to comfort us and to give us that freedom. Listen, I want to pray for you. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes. Our worship team is going to come back up. Nothing funny or weird is going to happen. No one's coming to get you or anything like that. But I know that we're in a jail cell. Some of us have been in there for so long. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us, to move us down the right path, to change us. Love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, goodness. Man, that sounds good. You may be thinking, I haven't experienced that in a long time. And it's in this moment that he can completely open up the jail cell and say, hey, just come with me. I'm going to walk with you through this. And it all starts with that one step, that one decision to say, I cannot continue to do this. I cannot continue to believe the lie of the enemy that I believe, believe for so long. And you just say yes. And you take that step. It starts with the decision. It starts with acknowledging them. And you just start by simply saying, God, I love you. And I need you. And I don't want to do this on my own anymore. God, I recognize that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for me. And I ask for forgiveness for all of my sins. I recognize him as my Lord and Savior. And I want to make him number one in my life. And God, for all of us, I just pray that we'll be able to experience your Holy Spirit. In our everyday lives, at work, at school, with our families, with our friends, at the grocery, whatever it looks like. 
God, I pray that we're open enough just to receive your spirit. That maybe those areas of our lives, those existing conditions that we think we were satisfied with, but now we're really not. God, I just pray that your spirit will help change us, to convict us, to lead us on the path that we are meant to lead. And not just being here lifeless, not living the life that we were called to live. God, I just pray for us to have the opportunities to show other people how amazing, how loving, how kind, how gracious you truly are. And we'll give you all the credit for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we honor Jesus together this morning? Come on.